Hi, I'm Deepak Bhatt from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, reporting for ACC.org from Paris, France, at the European Society of Cardiology and the World Cardiology Congress as well. I'm joined by Professor Gabriel Steg from the University of Paris and Chief of Cardiology at Hôpital Bichat, where I've got a lot of friends, I should add. So, terrific to be here. We've got a lot to cover. Uh, this section uh, and session might go a little bit long because we're reporting on the opening clinical trial session from today, and it was packed with good stuff. Actually, it started with a bang with uh, th these two incredible trials, Themis, Themis, PCI. I've got to commend whoever designed those trials. I would say <laughs> they are just trialist geniuses. Th these trials, you, you couldn't have had better designed trials. I'm I'm kidding. I, I, actually, uh, Professor Steg and I were the co-chairs of the study. Maybe I should turn it to you. A Themis and Themis PCI, what, what were they? What did they show? So they were looking at what is the role of ticagalor compared to placebo added to low-dose aspirin in diabetic patients with stable coronary artery disease. It's the largest ever randomized trial in patients with diabetes, 19,000 patients. To make a long story short, the trial had a primary outcome that was reached with a 10% reduction in the composite outcome of CVDSMI and stroke. The benefit was associated with an increase in bleeding, with a, a little more than two-fold increase in TME major bleeding, and some signal of increase in intracranial hemorrhage and fatal bleed. So there's a price to pay for the efficacy. There was a substantial discontinuation rate in both treatment arms with an excess discontinuation rate in the range of 10% largely driven by dyspnea, 6%, and then bleeding, 3%. And when you look at pre-specified on-treatment analyses, they look substantially better. But what's more important is that we had pre-specified a subgroup analysis looking at patients with a history of PCI. And the rationale for this is that patients who have had a PCI in the past have presumably been exposed to dual antiplatelet therapy and importantly have tolerated it. And our hypothesis in this pre-specified subgroup analysis was that these patients would have a better net clinical benefit uh, from Ticagalor compared to placebo. And that was borne out, because when we look at the net clinical benefit in that subset, first of all, when we looked at the absolute efficacy, the relative risk reduction was now 15%. There was slightly less bleeding. There was no signal of increased fatal bleeding, six events versus six events. No signal of increased intracranial hemorrhage with a significant interaction with history of PCI. And importantly, the hypothesis we had was verified. There was a significant interaction for net clinical benefit with clear benefit, 15% reduction in patients with a history of PCI and no benefit in patients without a history of PCI. So I think there's a message here for diabetic patients who have a history of PCI and are stable. We have a new treatment option, adding Ticagalor to low-dose aspirin and that can avoid a substantial number of events in that patient population. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of points. There was also, now I'm talking about overall in the trial, uh, a significant reduction in STEMI as a type of uh, MI. There was a significant reduction in amputations and acute limb ischemia. So other bad ischemic complications uh, were also reduced, but there is a price to pay in terms of a bleeding hazard. So as has always been the case with antiplatelet therapy and DAP and, and intensified regimens of, of double antithrombotics or even single antithrombotics. There's a, a bleeding risk and it's important to select patients that are low bleeding risk uh, before considering any of these sorts of strategies. So uh, I think it was an interesting uh, way to start the session off and I think it adds to the continuum of risk that's out there where one might consider extended duration double antithrombotics moving just from ACS to patients with stable MI now to consider it in those with diabetes and stable coronary artery disease in particular those with prior PCI. The next trial that was presented, uh, we can actually uh, lump them together, uh, it was a heart failure trial. There was the uh, trial Paragon looking at sacubutyl uh, valsartan uh, and also added on as a late, late breaker uh, was uh, DAPA heart failure where the results just became known a few weeks ago. And I, I think both add immensely to our understanding of heart failure. Uh, and uh, do you have any comments about these two yeah, trials? Yeah, I think Paragon heart failure was really a, a, a landmark trial now, the top-line results have been uh, announced, and they've been announced to be negative, which I think is an unfair characterization, and I was not associated with Paragon HF in any way. These investigators looked at circuitral valsartan versus placebo in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, and the primary outcome of CVDES of, uh, and hospitalization for heart failure was reduced with a p-value of 0.06. Now, 
I don't think that we should take a binary view of trials and say right. P equals 0.06, this is a negative trial, P equals 0.045, this is a positive trial. I think this is ludicrous, in particular for HFPEF patients who are a very gr large group of patients with a very poor prognosis and for whom there is no evidence-based therapy. So I see this as extremely encouraging. Further analysis of other endpoints in the trial and subgroups in the trial are far more positive, so I think there's a lot of good news. In fact, I view, these, I view this trial as really opening a new avenue of treatment for patients with HFPEF. Yeah, I'm with you, and I also had no involvement with the trial. I mean, Scott Solomon, who presented it, is right down the hallway from me, but we haven't talked about the trial results at all, so I only found out right here at the ESC and, and have the exact same impression that you do. Yeah, I mean, one can be a purist and say, oh, it, you know, it, it missed the... Uh, uh, p-value and the press release actually said narrowly missed that that prompted some conversation around uh, the company's verbiage there but but in fact it was narrowly missed and you know I think especially taken with the totality of data about this compound uh, data from paradigm where you know obviously uh, it, it, the drug hit it out of the park I, I think this is a potentially useful option for HFPEF where we can't do that much and the subgroup of patients that had sort of a lower ejection fractions uh, within the HFPEF categorization did seem to derive a more substantial benefit. So it's probably, you know, HFPEF is a tough disease, it's very heterogeneous, and even though they did a, a reasonably careful job here characterizing it, it's tough to characterize. And I do think there's some part of the universe of HFPEF that does benefit from this therapy. Had they had a thousand patients more in the same trial and the exact same treatment effect, it would have been a resounding success. So yeah, I think I we have to be measured when we describe trials results as positive and negative. No, I agree, but I, I'm sure this uh, discussion even will be controversial, and there's the issue of cost. You know, should you use it? Will it get FDA labeling when it hasn't met the primary endpoint? Those are all interesting points, but from a patient perspective, it is a potential option one could consider. All right, so that's uh, that one. How about DAPA heart failure? That was another well, really interesting study that moves the field forward. More good news for SGLT2 inhibitors. It's the class that keeps on giving. That's right. Yesterday we were talking about Emperor outcomes and analysis from that. Now we've got DAPA heart failure. And here, looking also at diabetic patients uh, that have uh, heart failure uh, with reduced ejection fraction, but importantly also the non-diabetic patients. Yeah, so I think this bodes well for other trials that are coming up looking at the use of SGLT2 to prevent heart failure or treat heart failure in patients who have no diabetes at all. And I think we'll get a lot of... Um, uh, um, Coming, there are a lot of trials coming up, and hopefully they'll, be, they'll confirm what we're seeing or even amplify what we're seeing. So I think this is really good news for the heart failure patients to have you know, reasonably cheap, reasonably well-tolerated, and effective therapy to treat heart failure. And that's badly needed. As we know, heart failure is really a scourge, extremely widespread, very poor prognosis. We've made some improvements, but still we have a long way to go. Absolutely. And the final trial in this opening session where it was really action-packed, was the complete trial, and you're, of course, um, a co-author on the main paper. I was on the Data Safety Monitoring Board, uh, and I'll just give you uh, my perspectives, and I'd be interested in hearing yours. I, I thought this was an incredible trial, and it was fascinating on the DSMB to watch it as it was evolving. So I believe it's definitively answered this question of should you do complete revascularization in the STEMI patient, or should you just go after the culprit? And it clearly shows that complete revascularization is beneficial, not just for reducing future revascularization, we already knew that from, from prior trials and meta-analyses, but for reducing future myocardial infarction risk. And uh, to me, this is just a huge breakthrough. And it may not be so important uh, when that revask is complete. That is, I'm not saying necessarily the study says you need to do it at 2 in the morning, but probably sometime in the ensuing uh, days or weeks would be a good idea to complete the revask. Yeah, I think that that trial has to be characterized as a home run, really. Um, and we have to credit uh, the Canadian investigators at McMaster who led that trial, Shamir Mehta and David Wood. Really, they, had, they did a spectacular job. The magnitude of the benefit is huge, so there's no question that practice now has to be grade one recommendation in the guidelines for complete revascularization of these patients. Yeah, so this was a terrific session. Let me just throw in one other trial. There's a lot of other ones. For the sake of time, we're not going to be able to cover everything. But um, uh, the ISRA REACT uh, 5 trial, that was a randomization to prazagrel and ticagrel, open-label study. 
uh, showing actually a huge benefit for Prazigrel versus Ticaglor. Honestly, it was far more than I would have anticipated, given just that they both provide similar degrees of antiplatelet effect. Uh, what do you think of that study? Well, first of all, I'd like to commend the investigators, uh, the uh, Munich investigator group, who's done a lot of trials in the past for doing this relatively small trial without industry support, which explains why it's open label and some of the technical aspects. Right. But in, in that 4,000 patient trial, you get a 40% reduction in event rates with Prazogrel compared to Ticagalor, although the administration and the preloading regimens were quite different for the two drugs. There was no preloading with Prazogrel, whereas there, there was upfront treatment with Ticagalor. So that might have contributed. Now, what I can't reconcile is if in Triton, Prazogrel was 19% better than Clopidogrel, and in Plato, with 18,000 patients, uh, Ticagalor was 16% better than Clopidogrel, how can Prazogrel be 40% better than Ticagalor? So I think that we need to reconcile all of that. All of that. But still, I think it's a very interesting uh, result. Many of the cardio interventional cardiologists have been arguing about their preferred P2Y12 inhibitor, <laughs> and I think here we have some piece of randomized evidence. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting, and of course, Prazogrel is going generic in, in many different locales, so you know that could be a factor too. But but uh, well done trial. But I, I, I was also the, the math didn't necessarily make sense to me that there could be such a large risk reduction. I mean, it, it's almost greater than the risk reduction of you know clopidogrel versus placebo. So I, I, I'm not sure how to put it all together. I'm sure it'll prompt a lot of debate. In fact, I think a lot of these trials are going to prompt uh, lots of controversy and discussion and debate. Uh, but we're just giving you a sampling. Hopefully those of you at home have enjoyed this discussion, and it will prompt you to go to acc.org and get further details. Thanks so much for joining.